So uh, my name is Atalia Omer, and I'm um, a professor here at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and the Kiyo School. Uh, and, um, but I have uh, the great honor to be standing here uh, as the um, faculty advisor of uh, Student Voices for Palestine, which is a, um, a new, relatively new, it's, uh, now it's on its second year, um, students group. And I would like to invite um, Flora to uh, say a few words about Student Voices, if she's here. <laughs> oh yeah, here she is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you especially to um, Dr. Omer and Asis Atik um, for joining us today. Um, my name is Flora, and I'm part of a club called the Student Voices for Palestine. And we are a relatively new club um, on campus that seeks to um, create dialogue and advocacy um, for justice um, in the Palestinian regions and for the people there. Um, yeah, so our club does a bunch of events um, from lectures, conversations, movie watches, and all of that. So if you're interested in, um, in hearing more from us or come, coming to one of our events, um, we have a sign-up sheet actually right outside of um, this, those doors. Um, so feel free to sign up um, with your email address afterwards. So thank you everyone for coming again. Okay. Uh Thank you, Flora. So the event to today um, was enabled or was um, really uh, imagined by um, Student Voices for Palestine and was enabled uh, as well by uh, the Kroc Institute and the Kellogg Institute. Um, so, um, uh, but it's a wonderful occasion and uh, it's great to see so many of you uh, here. Um, so, um, uh, uh, so welcome, and um, uh, and really uh, we can proceed with um, a brief introduction so that we'll have um, we'll maximize our time for um, uh, for conversation, discussion, and listening. Uh, so I have the great honor to um, to introduce Naima Tik, who is Palestinian, is also an Anglican priest, and is the founder of Sabil. Uh, Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center that is located in Jerusalem. He's been pivotal in shaping Palestinian liberation theology, and he's the author of many, many books uh, that convey his thinking on the issues um, and what does it mean to articulate a Palestinian liberation theology um, uh, through grappling with, uh, with various challenges. Uh, some of the titles of his books are uh, A Palestinian Cry for Reconciliation, Challenging Christian Zionism, Justice and Only Justice. And the topic of today's presentation, as you all are all aware of, is his new book, A Palestinian Theology of Liberation, The Bible, Justice, and the Palestine-Israel Conflict. Uh, so it's, um, uh, uh, again, it's wonderful to, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to give um, Naim Atik the, um, uh, the stage here uh, at the University of Notre Dame. Responding to, um, uh, to um, Naim Atik's presentation, which will be about well, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, will be uh, Professor Rashid Omar, who is a professor of Islamic studies and peace building uh, at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Uh, as we were thinking about um, the format for today, we thought it would be uh, really interesting uh, to get um, uh, reflection, reaction, um, uh, engagement from, um, uh, uh, from uh, Professor Omar, who uh, is from South Africa and was uh, and participated very actively uh, as a Muslim leader um, uh, in the, uh, the struggle against apartheid. Uh, so, uh, so we thought that, that would be a very interesting kind of uh, conversation that we, we can have here and open it up for uh, further reflection from, um, from the audience. And we are also um, invited to offer um, a reflection, a reaction, a response. Um, uh, we invited uh, Marcel, Marcel Zugbi. Um, uh, we were just informed that uh, Naim has known her all her life <laughs> since she was a baby, um, but now she is um, uh, about to uh, conclude her first year as a master's student. Um, 
here um, at the, um, the brand new um, um, master uh, in, what is it called? Global Affairs. <laughs> uh, but, with, but most importantly, with a peace studies focus. Um, and she's um, uh, a Palestinian activist and um, and it's just um, uh, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to get those reactions and, and the intention is really um, to, to generate a conversation. Uh, so, um, so really with, without further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Naima Tip to the stage. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to be here at Notre Dame. Um, I wanna begin by bringing you greetings from Jerusalem. I was there less than two weeks ago. Uh, the situation back home is, uh, is uh, getting much worse uh, politically. Now, obviously this year, probably there are quite a bit of commotions there because it's Holy Week for the Christians it's Passover, Pesach for the, for the Jewish community, which really means every time there is a, a Jewish um, a feast, uh, there is a closure. And so many of our people are not able really to come to Jerusalem, even to attend the services there. Um, but um, be that as it may, uh, I think uh, I can say that uh, People, our people, Muslims, Christians, are uh, continue to live and continue to struggle for uh, justice and peace. I want to also begin by just saying thank you to the Notre Dame University uh, and for the Kroc Institute. I just found recently that my friend Asher is the director of the Kroc Institute. <laughs> so it's, it's a belated, but Belated congratulations. So, yeah, let's go. Um, I also like to, um, to to thank all those of you who are who have organized this event. I am really grateful, uh, Mary Claire. Thank you so much for all for you and for all the people with you who have done a wonderful job. It's really a privilege to be here. I think I've been here once before and uh, I cannot remember how far back, or I remember that I spoke in one of the classrooms, but I think it was a very short visit when I came here. The other thing I, I cannot believe it is that I look around and I see so many, uh, so many friends. So I'm very grateful. I feel like at home, you know, with Asher and also with my friend Rashid, Omar, you know. I remember many years ago, on my first visit to South Africa, Rashid was uh, the imam of one of the mosques there. I've never been invited uh, to speak in a mosque. I've attended many mosque prayers because of my Muslim friends. But Rashid comes and he says, I want you to, to preach, uh, uh, to speak in my mosque. I said, look, I don't have to worry my clerical color. I can come, you know, just with an open shirt. He said, no, I want you to come with your color to the mosque and you speak. And Cedar Duhaibis, you know her, Asher, was with me. And both of us went to the mosque and she was sitting at the back. Uh, uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And then later on, on another visit, I went to South Africa. Rashid was here in the States. He probably was at Notre Dame here, you know, but he told his wife, he said, you welcome Naeem and you ask him to come to the, to the mosque, you know, and I went there and I spoke again in the mosque. So our friendship goes back a good number of years now and I have always appreciated uh, your work and your prophetic voice also there. Um, in a special way, I really would like to thank all of you students uh, for coming to, to hear me. I, 
I love to be with students, uh, and I appreciate very much that you are taking the time to be here. I want you to, to I want to tell you, frankly, my generation has failed to find a just peace in Israel Palestine. So, in many ways, I trust that your generation will achieve a just peace based on international law and UN resolutions. And I pray that you will be more successful than we have been. And I hope that my presentation this evening will stimulate you and you will become committed to the work of justice. And when we talk about justice, when we talk about liberation, we are talking about liberation and justice and peace for all the people of the land, Israelis and Palestinians, Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Now, my objective in this presentation is really to introduce the new book to you. So I will not go into great details, but before I introduce the book, I really want to give a historical uh, background about the way the development of uh, uh, actually the emergence of Palestinian liberation theology. And, um, and also I will touch on history before 1948 when the, when the um, Israel was established. And I hope again, throughout this background and through introducing the book, I will stimulate your thinking so that you will become engaged with us in the struggle for peace. With this, I'd like to begin. I will read most of this so that it will be less time. I've been told that maybe I need to speak for about 40 minutes, if it's okay with you. 10 minutes more than what you've given me. But uh, I, um, I hope I will, I will do that uh, almost to the point of about 40, 40 minutes, maybe 41, maybe 42, not more. <laughs> okay. The Nakba of 1948 left the Palestinian community in great shock. People could not believe what happened. Their whole life was turned upside down. They had suddenly become impoverished by the loss of their land, home, businesses, resources, and communities. Most of the people, most of the Palestinians, had been evicted by force or fled in fear from their villages and towns. Around 750,000 Palestinians were dispossessed. The UN, United Nations, called for the return of the refugees, but that did not happen. The refugees found themselves living in refugee camps away from their homes, and for many of them outside of Palestine and in the neighboring countries. For no crime they have done or they have committed, save the fact that the Jewish Zionists from abroad were claiming Palestine as their own. It's important to emphasize that the indigenous Palestinian Jews of Palestine, that is Palestinian Jews, who were, with, who were living in Palestine for many, many years, like the Christians and like the Muslims, also reacted negatively against the Zionists. The first UN General Assembly, number 194, affirmed the right of Palestinians to return to their homes and property. It was passed on December 11, 1948. Significantly, one day before, one day before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
came into being on December 10, 1948. Article 13 of the Declaration of Human Rights says, everyone has the right to leave any country, including their own, and to return to their country. Israel's acceptance as a member of the United Nations was conditioned by its endorsement and implementation of Resolution 194 that the Palestinian refugees should return home, return home and receive compensation on conditions that they live in peace with Israel. Israel accepted this, but once a member, it reneged and did not implement the UN resolution. The great powers of the day, namely the United States and Britain, did not force Israel to implement 194 resolution. They could, have, they could have, but they chose not to do it. It stands to reason that they were in collusion with the Zionists. The UN General Assembly Resolution 194 for the return of the refugees was passed and repassed again and again in successive UN General Assembly sessions, but no action ha was taken to enforce to enforce it. It remains a blot, in my opinion, a disgrace on the conscience of all those powers who were partners in the crime against the Palestinians. The Palestinians call that the catastrophe of 1948 Nakba. It was a Nakba against over a million innocent Palestinians who were denied the right of self-determination. The act for me, this act for me, was evil. That's the way I would see it, as a Palestinian. The greater catastrophe, however, and the greater evil, was that many of these people behind the powers believed that they were agents of God, bringing into fruition God's will for the world through the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. They had no qualms about crushing innocent human beings. And I ask, what kind of a theology of God did these people have? I don't believe that God enjoys crushing innocent people. This is not the God that I believe in. I believe it was naked human hubris, power politics, and it was another shade of colonialism and imperialism. Those powers wanted to, sh to reshape the Middle East as they please. Their military and political power made them believe that their might will make right whatever they want. From their perspectives, the Zionists seem to be pawns in their hands. Realistically, however, the powers, Britain and the United States, I believe, were pawns in Zionist hands. The Zionist and later the government of Israel has been clever to reach its goals through manipulating and deceiving the powers, especially the United States, the American power. In such scenarios, the Palestinians stood no chance. Whatever happened to them, was immaterial. What was important that for these Christian Zionists, God's plan of history must be realized. Now, it's very interesting to point to you that on September 17, 1948, few months after the creation of the State of Israel, Jewish terrorists, exactly, I mean, the Stern Gang, whose one of its leaders was Yitzhak Shamir, a future prime minister of Israel, assassinated this stern gang, assassinated Count Falk Bernadotte of Sweden, who was the UN mediator to Palestine. Although the Israeli government condemned the assassination, it never apprehended the culprits, although they were very well known. They knew, the, they knew who they were. The first secretary, General of the United Nations, 
said that if the great powers accepted Israel's behavior, it would be quite clear that they would be tacitly admitting that the Security Council and the United Nations was a useless instrument in attempting to preserve the peace. Israel's failure to catch the assassins created a precedent that has become the pattern in Israeli behavior. Since then, Israel started flouting UN resolutions with no one to stop it. The international community has been too weak to stop Israel's violations of international law. This is largely due to the support and protection of Britain in the beginning and later on the United States. Since the assassination of Count Bernadotte, Israel, generally speaking, did not pay attention to world opinion so long as the United States was standing on its side and protecting it. Let me now move to another issue. After the Nakba of 1948, the local churches in Palestine were impotent and had no voice. Almost all the church's hierarchy was foreign. A Greek Orthodox church patriarch. An Italian Roman Catholic patriarch. A British Anglican bishop. A German Lutheran Probst. The process of indigenization had not taken place. It would take 25 more years for indigenization to start, and even then, not completely. The Nakba did not produce an outcry from the church's hierarchy in Palestine or in the surrounding countries, locally or internationally. It did produce the channeling and administering of aid to refugees. I have often reflected on the statement of the prophet Micah in the Hebrew Bible. What does God require of us? The answer was clear, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. Acts of mercy, kindness, and compassion are and were essential to lessen the burdens of daily of the daily life for those Palestinian refugees. We needed mercy. We needed aid. But acts of mercy cannot be a substitute for justice. We must not stop with mercy. We must not allow mercy to trump justice. Unfortunately, Many times the church stops with aid and mercy and compassion. Unfortunately, it seems that the doing of mercy relieves the church's conscience. And they say, oh, we've done what we can. The prophetic imperative, my friends, is to do justice and to love mercy. Let me say a few words about church theology before 1948. In the early days of the Nakba, the theology of our church's hierarchy was a theology of resignation. Many of them believed that what happened was the will of God. This is, this is God wanted this. It is so easy to dump things on God. Dump the problem on God. Closes the, it closes the discussion. They did not question or test whether it was God's will or the will of sinful human beings. God does not will evil action. Human do. It is people of power who conspire against their fellow human beings 
to kill and dispossess them. As Christians, as humans, we must resist evil without using evil means. The church's hierarchy could have lifted that out an outcry against the injustice, but they did, that did not happen. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the Bible was not available for the Orthodox and the Catholics, the Catholic Christians. It was available for the Protestants and in Protestant schools. The missionaries were emphasizing the importance of personal faith in Jesus Christ. The children in schools were taught the contents of the Bible, both Old and New Testament. In their teaching and preaching, the Western missionaries spiritualized the text of Scripture. The local Palestinian Christians were not aware that the Old Testament contained within it texts. If used literally, it could dispossess them from their homes, land, and country. In other words, the Bible did not only bring them the blessing of salvation and redemption through Jesus Christ, it had the potential to ethnically cleanse them and uproot them from their land. In 1948, the Zionist ideology was not clear to most of our people. We did not know who these Zionists were, what, they, what their ideology is, what do they want to do. The first Zionists were not religious. They were atheist and secular. For them, they were conquering a land that many of them believed belonged to their ancestors. If they used the Bible, it was for political reasons. Some would say, the Bible is our land registry. Somebody, I repeated this sentence yes, last night uh, where I was speaking in Chicago. And uh, one person said uh, that the next quote I have, he said it was Ben-Gurion who said that. I, had, I don't, I'm not sure. But, uh, but I he I've heard people who would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, secular people, atheist, Zionist, they would say, we don't believe in God, but he gave us the land. It's very interesting, very interesting. It's important to note that long before political Zionism emerged, many Western Christian evangelicals believed that the return of Jews to Palestine was mandatory in order for the biblical promises of God for the Jewish people find fulfillment. Some of the Protestant missionaries that came to Palestine to evangelize Jews and Muslims and Christians um, espoused those kinds of belief. We know that one of the closest friends to Theodore Herzl uh, was William Heschler. He was an Anglican priest, like myself, but he was a Christian Zionist who supported Zionism and encouraged other countries to establish and encouraged Herzl not to waver on Palestine. At a time when Herzl was considering other countries to establish his Jewish state, Reverend Heschler was a major influence to keep Herzl focused on Palestine because of Heschler's own biblical interpretation of the end times and the role that Jews need to play in the end times. Some of the Protestant missionaries that came to Palestine were influenced by the teachings of John Nelson Darby. Darby was an Irish Anglican priest, but recant, recanted his Anglican vows and joined a small biblical evangelical group where he later articulated his theology of dispensationalism that believed in the importance of the return of Jews to Palestine in order to hasten the second coming of Christ. This Darbyism 
movement influenced many American Protestants and evangelicals like Dwight L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, and others. One of the most prominent proponents was Cyrus Schofield, who published his famous Schofield, Schofield Reference Bible that promoted, promoted dispensationalism, that impacted millions of evangelicals and Protestant Christians in this country who believed in the return of Jews to Palestine. Some followers of Darby started lobbying their government to send Jews to Palestine. In the, nine, in the 1840s, Lord Shaftesbury in England lobbied the British government. William E. Blackstone, an American evangelist from Chicago, next door, lobbied President Harrison to send, to send American Jews to Palestine. His book, Jesus is Coming, became a bestseller and was translated into many languages, including Arabic. I still have my father's copy, prob probably given to him by one of the British missionaries in Palestine. In this book, Blackstone states that Jews had to return to Palestine and establish their kingdom in order to hasten the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. Years later, there were other Europeans and American Christians that supported Zionism because of the suffering of Jews in the Holocaust. The well-known American scholar, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, some of the older folks here would know of him. He was committed to Zionism and was eager to bring justice to Jews, but was blind to the injustice against the Palestinians. He died in 1971, long after the creation of the State of Israel and the War of 1967. Yet to my knowledge, he failed to see the suffering and oppression of the Palestinians at the hands of the government of Israel. The same can be said about Bishop Professor Christer Stendhal. Again, some of you would know him. Dean of Harvard Divinity School, who only later in life was able to discover the violence of Zionism against the Palestinians. And when he raised the questions about it, I knew him very well. I knew him very well. When he raised the, the questions to his Jewish friends, it caused him the end of a lifelong friendship with Rabbi David Hartman of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. In essence, as far as the small Christian church in Palestine is concerned, we did not have an adequate theology to address the tragedy of Palestine, the Nakba. There was more silence than voices heard. As I mentioned, most of our clergy were influenced by Western theology that did not equip them for the impending disaster. It dealt with the salvation of their souls it prepared them for life after death, but not for life before death. By the early 20th century, we began to notice the slow rise of clergy and bishops from within the various churches of the land that started to raise the prophetic voice. One of the first bishops to raise the voice, the prophetic voice, was a Melkite by the name of Gregorius Hajjar, Bishop of Acre, Akka, and all of Galilee in the early 1900s. At the age of 26, Hajjar was consecrated bishop and played an important religious and political role in defending the rights of the Palestinian Arabs against the onslaught of the Zionists. His popularity among Muslims and Christians made people refer to him as the Bishop of the Arabs. Amazing. Bishop Hajjar testified before the Peel Commission in 1937. 
and talked against the Zionist project and its dangers on the social, political, and religious life of the people of Palestine. Unfortunately, he was killed in a car accident in 1940 as he was returning from Jerusalem to his sea in Haifa. The British mandatory powers never investigated his death. The Palestinians suspected the British, others suspected the Zionist. Another person, and in my opinion, he was really the first bishop who did a serious nonviolent uh, resistance against the Israeli uh, injustice. His name was Archbishop Joseph Raya, Yusuf Raya. Uh, before coming to Israel as the bishop of the Melkite community in, of Galilee, at the end of the 1960s, uh, Raya spent 17 years serving the Melkite church in Birmingham, Alabama. See, it's amazing how the connections, when you look at it, where he marched with Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement. As a bishop, he championed the cause of Ikrit and Kufr Birahim, two Christian villages in the north of Palestine whose inhabitants were evicted by the Zionists in 1948. The villagers were assured by the Zionist army that after two weeks, only two weeks, you know, then you can come back. This is the same ploy was used when we were evicted from Bisan. They said only two weeks, you can come back. It was a hoax. The Israeli Supreme Court, they went to the Supreme Court of Israel. In the Supreme Court, ruled in favor of the villagers of Ikrit and Kufar Barahim, that they need to go back to their villages. Archbishop led, Archbishop Raya led nonviolent demonstrations, sit-ins to pressure the Israeli government to implement its own Supreme Court ruling. Thousands of people marched with him, Christians, Muslims, Jews, but to no avail. One Sunday in August 1972, he ordered all the Melkite churches closed, to be closed on Sunday, and to toll the church bells with a funeral toll announcing the death of justice in Israel. Still, the government of Israel would not budge. Archbishop Priya became controversial, even with his, within his own denominations, and pressures mounted against him from various sides. He resigned his see in 1974, moved to Canada where he lived until his death in 2005. I visited him twice in Canada. Few, the last, the second time, just few weeks before he passed away. Raya inspired Father Shakur, many of you know him, Elias Shakur, who in 1984, wrote his first book, Blood Brothers, in which he told his own story about his village of Kufur Birim. His powerful story opened the eyes and hearts of many Western Christians who had never heard the background of the tragedy of the loss of Palestine. A few years later, we saw the rise of Palestinian liberation theology. I hope you, you have followed with me this uh, movement towards the rise of Palestinian liberation theology and the emergence of Sabil Ecumenical Center. Two events coalesced to trigger, to trigger the rise of this liberation movement. The first was 1987 Intifada. 40 years, 40 years after the Nakba, the Palestinian community rose up against the illegal Israeli occupation of the West Bank in, East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. It was a national nonviolent intifada. We felt, we felt it at St. George's Episcopal Anglican Cathedral in Jerusalem, where I was the canon pastor of the Palestinian congregation. Every Sunday, 
the local Christian community met after the Eucharist to reflect on the sermon that dealt with one aspect of the Intifada. Men and women discussed together what it means to be Christian living under the oppressive occupation. These, discu these discussions acquired the greater and deeper intensity, both biblically and theologically, as we were able to contextualize our faith and make it relevant to our daily life under occupation. More Christians from the other denominations began to join us at St. George's for worship and discussion. People would relate their stories of Israeli army brutality, the beatings, the incarceration of men, women, and children, some of them from our own congregation, and the nonviolent resistance of our people. The discussion became more exciting when these Palestinian Christians discovered that Jesus Christ, whom we call Savior and Lord, lived all his life under occupation. He was a Palestinian like us, born under occupation, lived all his life under occupation. He carried on all his ministry under occupation, and finally he was killed by the occupation forces in collusion with the religious leaders of his day. And so the questions of my, our people started asking the question, can Jesus help us? What can we learn from him if he lived all his life under occupation? And that immediately drove us back to the Gospels to study more about how did Jesus live, his way of life, his teaching, his relationship with other people. People began to see Jesus Christ as the, their para paradigm of faith and their liberator. It was there at St. George's Cathedral, Jerusalem, where Palestinian theology of liberation was born by the grace of God and by those faithful Palestinian Christians who were reflecting on their life of faith under the Israeli occupation. The second point that triggered the rise of Palestinian liberation theology is that providentially, I, my dissertation was, I, was tur I turned my dissertation into a book and I had the manuscript ready. And that's when I met, um, I met um, my friend, um, uh, the, the, the Jewish, uh, Mark Ellis, thank you. So all of a sudden, I, yeah, Mark Ellis. He came to, to speak in Jerusalem, and I tell you, it was a very difficult occasion for him when they reacted against him. But we became friends as a result of that. I handed him my manuscript, and he took it to Orbis Books. And in 1989, the book was published, and we marched then from then on to with the work of Palestinian liberation theology. And it was a wonderful, a wonderful journey so far. Uh, in order to just finish this uh, item, I would like to just mention a few of the titles of our international conferences, because it will give you an idea of the breadth of the theology that we were addressing. So I just, these titles just give you that idea. The first conference and I'm thankful to the presence of Kathy Bergen here because in 1990, we had our first uh, conference in, in, uh, at Tantur, actually. And Tantur is connected with uh, Notre Dame here. Uh, and uh, as a result of that uh, conference, we, had, uh, we came up with the book Faith and the Intifada. But so that one, that had to do with the, about Palestinian liberation theology, about my book that was just out. But another 1996, uh, listen to this, the significance of Jerusalem to Christians and Christians to Jerusalem. In 1998, the challenge of Jubilee, hollow land, holy land, hollow Jubilee, God, justice, and the Palestinians. In 2001, one new humanity where justice is at home. 
in 19 in 2004 challenging christian zionism theology politics and the israel palestine conflict in 2006 the forgotten faithful a window into the life and witness of christians in the holy land in 19 in 2008 the nakba memory reality and beyond in 2011 challenging empire god faithfulness and resistance in 2013 the bible and the palestine israel conflict and last year 2017 jesus christ liberator then and now before i turn to my book i need to mention one more thing the kairos palestine document it was launched in 2009 and was produced ecumenically by a group of christian bishops clergy and lay people lay women and men of the various churches Kairos Palestine constituted a genuine Palestinian Christian voice that spoke truth to power. If you have not read this small document, I challenge you to read it. Kairos Palestine document. So let me finally turn to uh, my new book, A Palestine Theology of Liberation, Palestinian Theology of Liberation, The Bible, Justice, and the Palestine-Israel Conflict. The new book completes the trilogy of books that I have been able to write on Palestinian liberation theology. Intentionally, it's a short book that introduces the reader to Palestinian theology of liberation. It draws on some of my earlier writings, but it goes further by expanding the research on this topic. The reader will find in this book history, Bible, theology and politics this is the nature of our life back home as we live our life comprehensively we are affected and impacted by those all these disciplines as well as the ecumenical and interfaith relationships that we have it's important to emphasize that the past the past lives vividly in Palestine, Israel. In a special way, the government of Israel is forcing its Hebrew past in order to legitimize its occupation and shape its present and future domination of the Palestinians. Obviously, I am writing as a Palestinian Christian, but I'm also an Israeli citizen. This means that I have experienced Israel since its inception. I was a boy in 1948 when we were evicted and dispossessed by the Zionists by force from our home in, in, in Bissan, south of the Sea of Galilee. Although I am writing primarily to Christian brothers and sisters, I pray that Muslim and Jewish readers might find the book informative and hopefully stimulating religiously and theologically. In a special way, I hope that the book can be useful to pastors, ministers, and priests. It's a book that raises and answers many questions that people ask. It's clear that my focus is on justice because only the doing of justice as defined by international law will guarantee a peace that can prevail and endure. I would also like to express my appreciation to Professor Walter Brueggemann for kindly writing the books forward. So let me at the end offer some uh, points that you find in the book, hopefully to stimulate you. I'm not gonna tell you everything in the book, otherwise you will not get it. So I have to just stimulate your thinking. What is Palestinian liberation theology? This is one of the most frequent questions I'm asked. I touch on it throughout the book, but towards the end, I mention 10 basic guidelines that reflect the scope and breadth of this theology. Who are the Palestinian, who are the Palestinian Christians generally? And who are the Palestinian generally, and who are the Palestinian Christians specifically? And what are the main challenges that have faced and con confronted 
Christianity over the last 2,000 years. Many people see the Palestine-Israel conflict as extremely complicated. I don't think so. What are the roots and conflict of the conflict? And how can it be resolved? I try to give a simple answer from my own experience. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, contains various types of material. Some of it is palatable and beneficial, like the Psalms, many of the Psalms I repeat on a daily basis. They're part of my spirituality. They lend itself to spiritual health, while others are difficult to understand and are detriment to our faith and human mor morality. How can we handle the moral, religious, and theological discrepancies that are in the texts? I try to give the reader more than one key that can help unlock those dilemmas. Another point. Where do we find the climax of the Hebrew Bible? The climax of the theology in the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. One of the most beautiful stories in the Hebrew Bible that was authored by a very gifted writer is that of Jonah. After thousands of years, this story still has a great religious and theological relevance for our people and for our theology today. If only for this, you need to get the book. You know, see the climax of Old Testament theology. The Bible does not contain a solution to the political conflict. The solution of the conflict must be based on UN resolutions and the demands of international law. The Bible, however, can inspire us to do justice, to love mercy. Our conflict could have been resolved long ago had it not been for the Israeli government's disregard of international law and its persistent impunity. At the same time, it is important to remember that Israel would not have committed all these violations without the financial, military, and political support and backing of the United States. And what about the city of Jerusalem? A few months ago, President Trump thought that he found the solution to Jerusalem by declaring it the capital of Israel. His declaration exacerbated the problem rather than resolved it. Consequently, hundreds of Palestinians have been killed or wounded in defense of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is equally holy to the three religions. We, call, we recall the words of Jesus Christ when he looked at, the, at Jerusalem for the Mount of Olives before his passion. He wept over it and said, you don't know what makes for peace. I try in the book to offer some fundamental guidelines for the, for the resolution of Jerusalem. From the Gospels, we know that the summary of the law and the prophets is found in loving God and loving neighbor. When did the love of neighbor become the second commandment? Who was the first to initiate and promote, to promote this and connect it to the first great commandment? This is, I tell you, you would love this. In a nutshell, the political conflict over the land of Palestine has to do with the biblical theology of land. How did Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul interpret the tradition regarding the land? When you strip all of these religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, to their basic core, what is the heart of religious faith in the 21st century? What about this picture, the picture on the book? This is a little Palestinian girl in Hebron 
skipping from one very heavy cube, concrete cube, to another. The Israeli army builds these cubes, concrete boulders, to block village roads to prevent access of Palestinians going to their villages. For our people, these boulders are instruments of oppression. The little girl seems to be enjoying herself in skipping on them. She had turned the Israeli instrument of dom domin domination and oppression into a harmless game for children. This is a good omen for the future and the sign of hope. That's why I chose it for the book. One can find many meanings. Take, a, take time to look at that picture and you will see why I chose it. In conclusion, Palestinian liberation theology believes that the justice we seek and work for has seven essential dimensions. Ideally, justice needs to be linked to every one of these dimensions. Here they are. Justice must be linked to love. When you love, you do justice. Justice must be linked to mercy. Justice must be linked to truth. Justice must be linked to security. Justice must be linked to nonviolence. Justice must be linked to peace. Justice must be linked to reconciliation and forgiveness. My friends, I challenge you to read the book, become engaged with us in the work for a just peace so that all the people of Israel and Palestine can live in peace and security. Thank you. Good evening. I fondly recall that Canon Dr. Naeem Atik visiting Cape Town, South Africa in 1994, shortly after we celebrated our freedom from a half a century of white apartheid racism. At the time, the theological cosmopolitanism, the inclusivity, and the interfaith solidarity that he impressed me so much that I invited him to speak at the Friday congregational service at the Claremont Main Road Mosque, where I serve as the Imam. Almost a quarter of a century later, it is a great honor and a privilege for me to be invited to respond to Naeem Stefan Atik's latest book on Palestinian liberation theology at this very heartwarming occasion hosted by the Kroc Institute and by the University of Notre Dame. As a Muslim scholar, I view my comments to Reverend Naeem Atik's books as a critical part of how he understands Palestinian liberation theology. It is an interfaith theology. However, I hasten to point out that it is a radically different kind of interfaith theology and dialogue that has become popular in recent times. Interfaith dialogue and solidarity as an essential pillar of Palestinian liberation theology goes beyond what Naim Atik's good friend, the Jewish scholar Mark Ellis calls, and I quote, the ecumenical deal, unquote. In the latter form of interfaith dialogue, social justice issues, and more particularly the unjust policies of the Zionist state of Israel is really part of that interfaith agenda. 
Now, MIT concurs with Mark Ellis that much of the contemporary interfaith dialogue industry is founded on the exploitation of Western European Christian guilt for its role in the Holocaust. And thus it serves to silence any legitimate criticisms of the unjust policies of the State of Israel. In the remainder of my remarks, I would like to draw two parallels between our struggle against the racist apartheid system in South Africa and the ideas and the practice articulated in Naim Atik's book on Palestinian liberation theology. In the first point, I draw a synergy between the two struggles. And in the second, I identify an important dissonance. When comparing the South African apartheid system and the Zionist state of Israel, the most obvious starting point is the abuse of the Bible in defending and upholding justice, injustice, and atrocity. In the case of South Africa, white theologians of the Calvinist Dutch Reformed Church used the Bible, and they could quote to you particularly verses to justify the apartheid racist system of racial discrimination and the oppression of black South African citizens. In fact, our educational system, of which I'm a product, was called Christian National Education. Similarly, Atik eloquently illustrates that in the case of Palestine, religious Zionists, and in fact, many more Christian evangelicals, use texts within the Old Testament to justify the forcible expulsion of indigenous Palestinians from their ancestral lands in order to legitimate the continued expansion of the Zionist state of Israel and the unjust persecution of Palestinians. In 1985, this duplicity led black theologians in South Africa to produce a theological document called the Kairos document. And one of the central questions that the Kairos theologians grappled with, and which is indeed the central theme of Naim Atik's book, is the following. And I quote, this is from the South African Kairos document, 1985. I quote, can the Bible be used for any purpose at all, unquote. The answer is a resounding yes. As a Muslim theologian, I have asked a corollary question. Is this unique to the Bible? The answer, of course, is no. All of our sacred texts, including the one that I hold holy, the Quran, are open to interpretation. And as such, certain texts can be exploited to justify violence and atrocity. There are some sacred texts that provide opportunities for justifying violence, while many others exhort us to embrace the other with love and compassion. Arguing within the context of the Muslim sacred scripture, the Quran, Khalid Abu Al-Fadl provides a cogent response to this dilemma when he says, and he asks, the meaning of the text is often as moral as the reader. If the reader is intolerant, hateful, and oppressive, so will be the interpretation of the text, unquote. The point is that all of our sacred texts provide possibilities of interpretations that are both intolerant and tolerant. Naim Atik de de deals very frankly and honestly and decisively with the ambivalent texts from the Old Testament. His radical and some may say controversial call is for, for a theology and a biblical hermeneutic that expunges exclusivist big and bigotrous and violent texts by embracing the Christian theology of love. For Atik, the hermeneutical key that may help us to mitigate the abuse of the Bible in furtherance of injustice 
is that of the central biblical teaching of the love of God and the love of thy neighbor, the second commandment. For Atik, and I quote, together and inseparably, these two teachings can help us determine the mind of Christ for our daily life and help us measure what is right and authentic in our relationships we can enjoy with God and with our fellow human brothers and sisters, unquote. The second critical point of comparison that I would like to draw between the South African anti-apartheid struggle and the Palestinian liberation theology is on the question of violence. In this regard, I believe Palestinian liberation theology to be unique, both from that of the other two strands of liberation theology, which incubated in Latin America and in South Africa. In his book, The Ambivalence of the Sacred by Scott Appleby, he contends that because of the endorsement of revolutionary violence against state terror and oppression, the progenitors of Latin American liberation theology, which were in fact purged by the Catholic Church throughout the 90s, were pejoratively called Bible and Bazooka Christianity. In the South African case, the following quote from Archbishop Desmond Tutu captures the duplicity that black Christians saw in the mainstream tradition on violence. And I quote, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who plotted to murder Hitler, came to be regarded as a modern day martyr and saint. But when it comes to the matter of black liberation, the West and most of the church suddenly begins to show pacifist tendencies, unquote. In contradistinction to the Latin American and South African strands of liberation theology, Naeem Atik has been unequivocal in his plea for a strategy of nonviolence, even in the face of the most severe provocations. Atik makes a cogent case for a strategy of nonviolence when he argues, and I quote, where we can match Israel is through nonviolent resistance. The Israeli military is not trained for nonviolence. The state of Israel doesn't know how to respond to nonviolence. Train people for nonviolence and we can prevail, unquote. This is indeed a noble call that resonates with me as a peace studies practitioner. In this regard, one of the most effective nonviolent strategies for prosecuting the Palestinian struggle for justice in the past decade since Atik's earlier book has been the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Campaign, BDS. BDS was launched in 2005 and is a Palestinian-led movement for freedom, justice and equality. Inspired by our South African anti-apartheid movement, BDS urges action to pressure Israel to comply with international law, to withdraw from the occupied territories, to remove the separation barrier in the West Bank, to grant full equality for Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel, and to promote the right of return for Palestinian refugees. In just over a decade since its launch, the BDS campaign has become a vibrant global movement made up of unions, academic associations, churches, grassroots movements across the world, and is effectively challenging international support for Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism. The alarming and draconian response of the Israeli state to the nonviolent BDS campaign is the most obvious and definitive indication that the boycott, divestment, and sanctions strategy is indeed very, very effective. On, on 11th of July, 2011, the Israeli Knesset passed a controversial law, making it a, a civil offense to publicly call for a boycott against the state of Israel. Last but not least, just over two months ago, on the 7th of January, 2018, Israel's Minister of Strategic Affairs published a list of 20 specific non-government organizations whose officials will be banned from entering the country, including BDS National Committee, the BDS France, BDS South Africa, BDS Italy, and BDS Chile. It is palpable that the BDS movement is undoubtedly the most effective nonviolent strategy 
in advancing the Palestinian struggle for justice and human dignity. It is therefore disappointing that the BDS movement as a, violent, as a viable non-violent strategy is not mentioned in Naim Atik's latest book on Palestinian liberation theology. It is only by providing concrete alternative nonviolent strategies that we can effectively decry violent options in the face of mass atrocities, such as the cruelty and brutality that Palestinians face. In conclusion, as a Muslim peace studies scholar, it is my considered view that Palestinian Christians, such as Reverend Dr. Naim Stefan Atik, they hold the key to unlocking the epic struggle for liberation. For Palestinian Christian voices, as we have heard, they are far more eloquent and more powerful than their Muslim compatriots. This is perhaps best illustrated in the theological document called Pal uh, Kairos Palestine, a moment of truth released in December 2010. It has long been my mantra that Palestinian Christians should be encouraged to become the voice and the mouthpiece of Palestinians to the world. They will bear witness to the same oppression and indignity of their Muslim compatriots. But more importantly, it will disarm Zionists and their Christian enablers from reducing the Palestinian conflict to a religious conflict where violent Muslim extremists seek to exterminate all Jews. The latter has become a dominant narrative in the West and Palestinian Christian activists have the power to shift this false narrative by foregrounding the settler colonial features of the Palestinian struggle for justice. Thank you for your patience. If you would just stay 10 minutes to hear my response, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Before I begin speaking, I would like to thank you, Assis Naim, for starting off your book, Introducing Palestinian Christians. As a Palestinian Christian, I often feel misunderstood and ignored by my international Christian family, especially those in the West. And I would like to ask everyone to visit not only our beautiful ancient stones, but also visit us, the living stones. If you come and see, you might feel overwhelmed, but you will also see and know that despite all the hardships, we continue to survive and live in our ancestral land. With this, you will also witness and learn about our continuing diaspora and exodus. The remaining Palestinian Christians in all of historic Palestine only make up 1.7%, and this is an estimated to be an inflated number. The figures of West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, are estimated to be 30 to 50,000 people. Now, to begin. This book has so much to offer us. It is, simply a, it is not simply a brief guide to the conflict with a special focus on Palestinian identity, but it is also a guide to understanding and realizing the wisdom and truth found in the Bible and how this truth can be practiced in our daily lives, especially in working towards a just solution to the conflict. The work of Palestinian liberation theology, according to Estes Naim, is a calling for everyone to have a peace and justice mandate. We have a shared responsibility to find a peace resolution to the conflict that is built on justice, truth, mercy, and reconciliation. This book highlighted the loss of Palestinian identity since 1948 and is intensified by Israel's attempts to erase Palestinian culture, history, and memory. I remember when I was 10 years old and I met Palestinian Christians from the Galilee for the first time. I was so shocked when I met them. Then I started to realize what a good job Israel was doing by erasing our identity and our beings to the extent that we had no idea the other existed. The system of checkpoints and the necessity of getting Israeli military permission to travel to the north to the Galilee from Bethlehem meant that we were rarely able to interact with our Christian family in the north. It's only a two to four hour drive from Bethlehem. It's not that far. But 
The way Palestinian communities have been geographically fragmented makes visiting each other very difficult. I have a Palestinian West Bank identity card, which means I cannot leave the West Bank unless I apply for permission from the Israeli military to enter Israel. And then there's a problem of transportation because my hypothetical car has a West Bank license plate, so it is not allowed to enter Israel. But every other person in the world with a valid driver's license plate, uh, driver's license, is able to drive a car with an Israeli license plate. And the list of restrictions goes on and on. The book also, also mentioned that Israel forbade us to talk about Palestine or Palestinians before the Oslo Accords of 1993. In fact, I would add that in 1967, the state of Israel banned the Palestinian flag in the occupied Gaza Strip and West Bank. In, 98, in 1980, a law forbidding artwork of political significance, which means artwork using colors of the Palestinian, Palestinian flag, was banned, and Palestinians were arrested for displaying such artwork. In response to this ridiculous law, and as a form of nonviolence resistance, some Palestinians started walking around with slices of watermelon as edible art and a sign of their identity and resistance. Some were imprisoned for carrying these watermelon slices. To continue these past events, two days ago was Palm Sunday, and in Jerusalem, this is a time when people come from all around the world, carrying their flags while marching and singing Hosanna to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. While I am here, my friends and family were marching and celebrating in occupied Jerusalem. This year's procession ended prematurely when Israeli police attacked some Palestinian Christians physically, arresting one person and taking the flags out of the Palestinian Christian hands. They even closed the gate leading into Jerusalem. As Christians, we believe in the continuous rebirth and crucifixion of Jesus, which makes me beg the question as to whether Jesus entered Jerusalem this year or was instead arrested singing Hosanna. Assis Naim, Assis Naim's book also talked about the events from 1948 onward and that on issues that are still ongoing till today. I agree with his statement that the life of the Palestinians under Israeli government continues to worsen for all Palestinians in the entire Holy Land. And unfortunately, the justification is now in the name of God and the Bible. The fact that these Palestinian human rights violations are being done and committed on a daily basis in the name of my religion, in the land of Christ, is sad and hurtful. One of my favorite quotes from the book reads, Love and justice are two sides of the same coin. When people love God, they do justice to their fellow human beings. When people love their neighbors, they do justice to them. When love is absent, injustice is bound to ensue. I share the same belief of Assis Naim in that our job as Christians is to imitate Jesus. Jesus never quoted the book of Numbers that approved the expulsion of people or anything to do with ethnic cleansing. Here's a personal story. My pregnant aunt lost three unborn babies, fetuses, twins from a rubber bullet shot at her by Israeli soldiers and most probably paid by U.S. tax dollars, and one fetus because of inhaling too much tear gas. A few, year la few years later, on Good Friday, Israeli soldiers shot tear gas at my pregnant mother. Luckily, both her and I survived. While studying in the U.S., a kind young Christian man kicked me on the ground, spouting hateful words, wishing me ill will, and saying he hopes I never have any terrorist children. How do I and we Palestinians respond? Then, with that question in mind, I came across, it in, uh, across a passage in Assis Naim's book. He gave a theological explanation of how in 1 Samuel, the people's perception of God is as a tribal and warring God. In 1 Samuel, the people believed that God had instructed them to kill the Amalekites. The quote goes, kill both man, woman, child, and infant. Assis Naim also cited David K. Shipler, an American professor who talked about how young yeshiva students at Kiryat Arba, which is an illegal Israeli settlement near the Palestinian town of Hebron, 
These yeshiva students were learning that today's Palestinians and Arabs are the Amalekites and that Jews needed to fight eternally and destroy them. Also, Naim mentioned, in, uh, uh, mentioned an article in Haaretz, uh, an Israeli newspaper. The Israeli Minister of Justice was calling for murdering Palestinian mothers so they do not give birth to more snakes. This is problematic because it creates extremism among settlers and people in general. And that extremism leads to gross human rights violations. This is the problem with religious leaders who interpret parts of the Bible without looking at the whole picture. I cannot imagine a God of love. Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the Liberator, would condone such behavior or thinking. Like Assis Naim, the way I have started to interpret the Bible is that if whatever actions or ideologies I have is consistent with God's love, justice, and peace for others, then it is from God. God does not kill. If someone tries to justify killing in God's name, that is not from God. That is people trying to justify their own selfish desires. Today and every day, Palestinians, my aunt, my mother, Assis Naim, and myself stand tall, working towards restorative justice and for a just and sustainable peace for all. In the wise words of my father, he said, we want to bring Israel to its senses and not to its, and not to its knees. And I continue today taking this hate and violence directed towards myself and my Palestinian community, justified in the name of a loving God, and turn it into an undying passion to work towards justice and peace. I believe that the first step is to have a better understanding of God. I share the belief with Assis Naim that God is an inclusive and all-embracing loving God. Therefore, we must work towards changing entire mindsets to be built on respecting the dignity of the human person. The distortion that's occurred with Zionism needs to be fixed. This is the cross I have to bear. And I would invite you, as we approach Easter, that if you do not have a cross of your own, or if your cross isn't heavy enough, take the opportunity to be like Simon of Cyrene and help someone else carry their cross. And if you are brave enough, come and help us Palestinians with our cross and bring a few friends because it's quite heavy. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, really uh, incredibly stimulating um, remarks and responses. Um, uh, let's take uh, just a few minutes to, because we can't just leave it uh, um, like this. We need to process it together um, a little bit um, uh, to begin uh, the process of, um, of Easter or Passover, however you want to, um, uh, to frame it. Um, one question, um, or I have uh, two questions uh, to start us off with uh, that um, really draw on some of the, uh, the issues that were um, articulated by um, uh, by the responses and of course your um, uh, your presentation. So um, I failed to mention uh, in in the introduction that the first time that I encountered you um, was in a, uh, a course at Harvard um, uh, that was taught by Harvey Cox. Um, it was a, a course on liberation theologies, um, and he introduced me to um, uh, to, uh, to your work, and it has really. Uh, uh, transform my thinking and uh, as I immerse myself uh, because I wrote my paper my final paper for the course on Palestinian liberation theology um, I, um, I, I also came across some of the um, uh, engagements with your with, with your words and it wasn't mentioned so I would just want to invite you to speak a little bit about um, uh, some of the uh, the critical engagements that highlighted uh, that um, um, your way, your way of engaging with um, uh, the Jewish sources, with the, the Hebrew Bible, um, uh, 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 really uh, converge with uh, kind of supersessionist approach where Christianity or the story uh, of, of Jesus supersedes um, other, other narratives. So I know that you've reflected on this, so I, I just want to, to invite you to speak about it uh, to, um, uh, to this audience um, uh, that... Um, uh, uh, this question of uh, supersessionism. Uh, and then um, another question that um, uh, uh, really draws on Marcel's point about um, uh, uh, interpretation uh, and Rashid's point about uh, 
uh, Christian Palestinians being the key to unlocking the, uh, um, uh, the narrative and the process of liberation. Uh, uh, to what degree can you reflect together with us on the kind of uh, um, challenges or how the challenges are being navigated where the um, exclusionary understanding of what the liberation is going to look like? Uh, so more specifically about uh, uh, Muslim, Muslim Christian uh, relationships in, in the context of Palestinian liberation. So, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Can you? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, uh, it's um, first of all, thank you, my friend Rashid. Uh, thank you, Marcel. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, on the question of superstitionism, um, it's a it's a big issue um, that has um, that has been difficult maybe to deal with because it it's not only have to do with uh, uh, people reflecting theologically; it has to do with emotions also. Uh, but uh, in the in the New Testament. Um, it's possible to find some verses, you know, that um, that can be interpreted as uh, the Christian Church has taken over uh, the place of uh, Judaism or Jews. You know, it all it all has to do with the question of chosenness or election. Uh, so there are obviously many texts in the in the Hebrew Bible that talk about God, uh, God's election of the Jewish people, um, and God's choosing the 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 Jewish people in a special way. Um, it's very clear in the New Testament. It's possible to find some verses where now that, that the Christians have become or have taken the place of the Jewish people in the, in the Hebrew Bible. And, uh, and that has, been, has become very, very difficult because politically it led to, the, to, um, to anti-Semitism over many centuries. And, and so after the Holocaust, when uh, groups of Jewish scholars and Christian scholars uh, were meeting to talk about how anti-Semitism had not only emerged but had had become uh, uh, become a danger, you know, in the history in the in the development of relationship between Christians and Jews, and how it has affected the rise. Uh, of anti-Semitism, um, and this was unbelievably bad, you know, where the Christians began to start to look at themselves and how they have uh, contributed to the question of anti-Semitism, you know. So many of the Christian scholars started to reflect on this whole question of election, and especially that on the superstitionism, which is that, uh, that the Christian the Christian church, the Christian community has uh, taken over and that now the Jewish people are, uh, are, not, are no more elected or chosen. Now, it's a, it's a big topic. It's a big topic. But basically, our contribution in Palestinian liberation theology was that I don't think this is right. I, I am aware of all the text in the New Testament. So I'm not... I'm not talking out of no, no knowledge. You know, I'm talking about having studied all these texts. I think we have a problem. We have a problem with the text also in the New Testament. But I really believe that we did not supersede or we did not take over. We did not, uh, uh, we did not uh, uh, substitute or uh, uh, taken over the role which Jews have. But we march together as people of God. And I would also open it up even, not only to Jews and Christians, I would open the whole question of election 
and chosenness to the whole of humanity. You know, that there are texts that talks about specifically about uh, election and chosenness, but I think theologically speaking today, we can talk more universally, you know, in that sense. And this is the way that I would really approach those texts. Sorry for a long answer, but uh, it's a very, uh, and you know, you can open even the internet. You can talk about election and so on. You can find articles on this and other ways. What's the second point? Uh, how, uh, No, I, I believe personally that we need to march together, knowing where the problems are. Now, I mean, thank God that there are scholars that have dealt with all kinds of problems, you know. I mean, whether it is Christian Muslim relations or Christian Jewish relations or the three of us, the whole interfaith thing, I think it is very difficult for us to begin to talk in an exclusive way. You know, God is bigger than Christianity. God is bigger than Islam. God is bigger than Judaism, you know. God is the God of all, the God of all people, uh, the God of the world, the creator, you know. Uh, once you begin to talk from that, this kind of perspective, I tell you frankly, you cannot begin to talk exclusively. You know, anytime you're talking exclusively, you're really missing the point, you know? And, and we need to realize that we used to talk exclusively. As Christians, we used to talk exclusively. And Muslims talk ex with exclusively and Jews the same thing. And many of our people, the three religions, we still, many of them talk, still talk exclusively. You know, even about Jerusalem. I mean, I could always hear, Jerusalem is Jewish. Jerusalem is Muslim, you know, um, or, or Christian. You know, we, we would say that. It doesn't make sense when you rise above all of this and you begin to have a vision of God who loves all people equally because God created us all and we, God loves us all. I mean, once you do this, you're really above all that of uh, that silly, I think, you know, silly way of looking at things exclusively. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Let's open up um, and maybe take uh, uh, three questions, but if you need a question mark, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead. And, and make sure you wait for the microphone. Um, thank you. And also, uh, you your Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Damon. I'm a graduate of the CROP program here, and I did an internship with uh, Gershon Baskin and Hannah Senora in Jerusalem some years ago. But... Uh, to get very quickly to the point, according to the scholar Lara Deeb, who did research in, in Lebanon, the members of Hezbollah have an extremely interesting understanding of their place in, in Islam. And it's a gendered understanding. So men and women see themselves differently. And women see themselves as emulating Zainab. And as in a kind of narrative of progression, there's a sense of sequence to what they're doing. Whereas, according to Deep, um, the men are going, uh, they're going to Kabbalah. And she doesn't mean by they're going to Iraq. No, she means that they're, they're becoming Hussein. They're like looking through Hussein's eyes, which is different to how the women are, are viewing it. And irrespective of whether we like Hezbollah or we don't like them, I think there's an incredible richness there and, uh, and their sense of time and their sense of place in it. So I'm wondering if you can find any parallels in Palestinian Christianity or not. Okay, uh, do you want to take uh, a couple more questions at the same time? Or? Okay, so let's take it uh, over there. Oh, hello. Hi. And, and be, be brief. Yes, very brief. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rob Delanoval. I'm in the history of Christianity. Um, my area of research has been um, Christianity in Russia, um, 19th and 20th century. And I've been struck there by the very interesting role that um, Eastern Catholics have played in kind of rising above the geopolitical conflicts of their time. There's a scholar in our department, Yuri Avakumov, who's worked quite a bit on this. And I was struck in your talk about the Melkite bishops 
who played such a role <clears throat> in bringing this conflict to an international consciousness. Uh, it made me think, I know you're an Anglican priest, but whether you have any further comments on the particular role that Eastern um, Catholics have played in these sort of conflicts and how this relates to, um, I mean, within the Catholic world, Eastern Catholics are very little known. Um, their existence is a surprise to many people, but I think their particular witness in standing between East and West can really bring, um, can contextualize and localize uh, the smallness of some of these disputes as you talk about it. So thank you once again. Well, you want to tackle those questions, and the next question will come from the woman. <laughs> you know, about, the, about Hezbollah, um, you know, I, first of all, I cannot really talk very much about the Shia, the Shia uh, branch of uh, Islam and uh, and their uh, their religious ideas i know very little about it but um, but many times i'm very much impressed by the speeches of uh, uh, of hezbollah uh, especially the the secretary hezb the secretary of the of the party uh, nasrallah uh, i'm impressed by his uh, by his ideas, I'm impressed by his uh, um, by his openness, and I think um, I find that there are things that I can identify with when it when he talks about justice or peace and so on. There are things that I disagree with, but you know maybe uh, my friend Rashid can answer specifically your 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 question. Uh, on on the on the Hezbollah, uh, because I'm sure they need, you need you need an answer to that. The other thing about the Eastern Catholics, I just want to say very briefly, and this historical point maybe it's important for all of us here. Um, the indigenous church of the land, the indigenous Christians of Palestine, uh, we would say the Orthodox, the Orthodox Church. This is Eastern Orthodox, Byzantine Orthodox. But in 1724, 17, there was a split within the Eastern Orthodox Church. And part of the church that split became known as the Eastern Catholics, or Greek Catholics, or Melkites. These are they are part of the Byzantine church that split. But now it has become very confusing to people because, you know, when I mentioned two of the bishops that I mentioned in my presentation, Hajjar and Raya, were Eastern Catholics. They were Greek Catholics or Melkites. And they are part of the original. My family is an Orthodox in, I mean, in the beginning, it is part of the families that were the indigenous church in Palestine that go back to the apostle times, you know. And, and so would be the Orthodox and the, and the Melkite Catholics. You know, they're also part of the early Christian church that was the indigenous church of the land. This is very important. But then after the split, unfortunately, all kinds of things and enmities and hostilities began to appear between them. But in my opinion, they're all Byzantine Orthodox Church of the land, and we and I am part of that, as many other people. Yeah, I'm not sure I can. I'm able to answer your question, Damon, because I'm I'm not a Shiite. I'm a Sunni. Well, this is wonderful because the key thing is that, you know, whenever we think about another group, we think of them as monolithic. No, there's a whole lot of groups, each one claiming to be the most authentic voice of Islam uh, and so on. But I also know within Shiism, 
I'm not sure about Hezbollah, the whole uh, Karbala and the, you know, Hussein narrative is very contested. Before the Iranian revolution, there was a very, lot of quietism. It was then used as activism with, the, uh, with Khomeini and the clergy. With the Iranian revolution, it continued to be so with the war with the Iraq from 1980 to 1988. Um, it was very expedient to use that more activist martyrdom, uh, you know, theology uh, to get young men to, to defend the uh, Islamic State of Iran. But in recent times, especially with regard to the Sunni violence of Al-Qaeda and Daesh, it appears there is a new thinking emerging, especially within Iran and Iraq. So you have, you know, they have the Arba'in, 40 days after uh, the martyrdom of Hussein. They have a march, millions of people. And that march has been recently you know, transformed in the sense by the horror of what the Shias are experiencing from Daesh to come back to embracing a more peaceful and a more compassionate vision of the events of Karbala. Very cool. So, um, other reactions? Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask very quickly, um, uh, Professor Naeem, you mentioned the uh, book Blood Brothers. That was something that really got through to the Western Christian consciousness. Um, and Professor Omar, you brought up the BDS movement. And I wonder just actually for all three of you, if, if you have any other suggestions for American Christians or in a broader interfaith context or secular context as well, like what have you found to be the strongest sources, um, whether other resources, books, organizations that you think Americans should really be tapping into right now? Thank you. You know, the literature now is immense, you know, there are so, so much that has been written and continues to be, to be written um, by, uh, by Christians, by Jews, by Muslims, you know, depending on what your uh, perspective or what you're looking for. But it is, you know, it's there. And I think there is a rich, richness in all of this and one can use it. Uh, so uh, if you have more specific uh, um, um, perspective that you're look, trying to look to for, let me know. I will try to help you with, with a, a number of books, titles. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe someone can help me. In the book by Jean Zaru. Jean Zaru. Yeah. yeah. Occupied with nonviolence. I Everybody think... here wrote it oh, in the okay. introduction <laughs> to peace studies. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from my perspective, I've had very interesting luck with churches in the US. I don't know if God has a funny sense of humor it's, or it's just my good luck, but a lot of the churches I've, ent um, I've shaken the hands with priests or um, pastors and I said, hi, I'm from Bethlehem. And then they would introduce me to everyone. We would like to welcome our Jewish sister from Israel. <laughs> so I guess um, the first thing would be, if I tell you my name is Marcel and you call me by I don't know, um, the name Mary, that's kind of rude and disrespectful. So if I tell you I'm from Bethlehem, from Palestine, and then you, for you to refer to me as Jewish from Israel, that's not really accurate. So first we need to get people to reflect. And I think that Christians um, from the U.S., when they're trying to understand the Bible, why don't you ask us? Why don't you ask the living stones? Because we've kind of, we live the same way, in a sense. And the stories from Jesus to my grand, great, great, great grandparents to, have been passed down from generations. Um, and I guess my other point was, I met a priest, and before he was going to give a Bible study, I told him I'm from Palestine. And I said I was very excited to be there. And then he gave us, uh, before he even started the, his Bible study, he said, let's talk about my experience in Israel, I was in a kibbutz and there was, I met a Jewish man, he was big and scary and, and he went on. And then after he concluded his story, he went on to, oh yeah, the, uh, the Bible says Israel, this, this, this. Afterwards, I went up to him and I said, you know what you did is harmful. And he looked at me, I can't lie. Why are you asking me to lie? I said, no, no, the way you structured it, you didn't differentiate between modern day Israel and Israel, the people of God. 
and to your audience, people look at you as a spiritual leader, as you know, um, you know, you know, the knowledge, so you can't, that's not, and he didn't understand what I said until he heard my story. Once he heard my story, he came up to me and said, thank you. I had no idea. And he said, you gave me a lot of things to think about. So my question is, why is, are Palestinian Christians forgotten? Why are we ignored? And why, when people are trying to understand the Bible, why don't you ask us? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> one of the, the points that Jim Zaru uh, articulates very well in um, those, this collection of essays uh, occupied with nonviolence uh, is that she, she contextualizes this, those misperceptions in a con uh, not only in reference to the kind of internal contestations with Christian Zionists and the kind of uh, harmful, violent, violent interpretations of, um, of Jewish uh, histories and identities and, and sources that uh, Jewish Zionists do, but also she talks about Orientalism, uh, empire, analysis of empire. She also talks, she also brings gender analysis, a gender lens uh, to kind of unpack and contextualize this question of uh, those misperce misperceptions. But the point of, uh, about Orientalism um, uh, is very key to, um, to this discussion. Um, and since we, we do have to conclude, I want to um, just react to something that um, Rashid mentioned about the, um, um, uh, with respect to the, uh, um, uh, the travel ban um, against uh, BDS activists uh, that... Um, uh, some of my favorite rabbis are now also banned from entering. <laughs> uh, um, so, um, uh, uh, which really highlights, um, uh, it, it really offers a moment of both in Trump America and this kind of um, uh, policies highlights um, um, uh, things with uh, very sharp moral clarity uh, for those who want to do, you know, uh, to be on the right side of history. Uh, so before we conclude, I would like to invite um, uh, Don Wagner, who's been accompanying uh, um, Naeem um, and for, for years now. <laughs> uh, uh, and you are, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the friends of Sabil yeah. in North America. And, yeah, North America. May I say yeah, yeah, yeah. just a few words before, uh, just one more. You know, my friend Rashid is right that in the book, in my book, I did not mention BDS as such. I talked about it but I did not intentionally mention it. And I just want to say why I, it was not like I had forgotten it, you know, <laughs> but, but I was afraid um, I did not want to be banned from going, going back home. <laughs> because I know some people who were returned. They would not allow them to go in. And so I, want, I talked about it but did not mention the term, the term. And that was the reason, yeah. So yeah. thank you for mentioning. Okay, I'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Don Wagner and uh, I was the national program director uh, until January when I retired, but I'm still very involved in Friends of Seville. And we have Friends of Seville North America, Canadian Friends of Seville. We have Kathy Bergen here from there. And uh, we have, uh, in many countries around the world, uh, we have friends of Sibyl. So I'll just say a little bit about we, what we do in North America. And we're trying to do the pra praxis of the engagement of taking liberation theology and putting it to work. And uh, I'll mention just a couple of our programs. Uh, one is we are focusing a lot on Hewitt Packard. And we have a program called HP Free Churches. And all you need to do is sign a statement that we will not buy any more HP products, including the ink, faxes, copy machines. HP is deeply involved with the Israeli military, is being boycotted by many churches, and uh, they do the magnetic cards, which tracks Palestinians. Uh, and this is perpetuating the occupation in a very deep way. They're involved with the Air Force. So we are boycotting HP products, Hewitt Packard. Maybe we could get an HP free department at Notre Dame. You don't have to throw your uh, printer out, just sign the pledge, no more HP products and buy something else. So let me know if you're interested in that, HP free Notre Dame and Kroc Institute and so on. So that, that's one. 
Uh, we take about six or seven witness trips. We call them witness trips because we are engaging the occupation and the struggle with both Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, we take about seven trips a year. My wife and I are leaving in two weeks on one. And the focus of our trip is popular resistance and liberation theology in Palestine. And we'll be looking at eight models of resistance, mostly nonviolent. And I know Kathy Bergen and Joy Lapp are leaving in, is it June, Kathy? And they're looking for people. Great opportunity, see, see Kathy uh, for that. It may be a little late to sign up for our group, uh, which is leaving in two weeks. Um, we send out action alerts every week. On, and if you're interested, let me just get your email. Uh, because we, Sabil puts out a wave of prayer which weaves theology into prayer and action. And it's a model, I think, of uh, praxis. And uh, when Trump moved the embassy, uh, we were calling on people to bombard your senators, members of Congress. And you probably know that the Christian Zionists, particularly Christians United for Israel, worked two months putting pressure on the Trump administration before that embassy moved. So he was playing in many ways to his 73% evangelical audience. And that raises another issue. We're working on Christian Zionism, and not just the evangelical form. I don't know if you realize there's a mainline liberal Protestant tradition of Christian Zionism that comes out of post-Holocaust theology. And this is where we call them PEPs, progressive except Palestine. And uh, we find it in many universities, many clergy. This is the ecumenical deal that was mentioned that Mark Ellis talks about, that we'll dialogue, have chicken dinners, and have wonderful relationships. Uh, but in those dialogues, often with the Jewish and Israeli establishment, you check Palestine at the door and don't mention it. It's, you know, leave it to others. It's too complicated for us. So we resist that. So we're critiquing mainline Christian Zionism in the churches, Catholic Christian Zionism, as well as Christian Zionism and the evangelicals. And uh, there's a group of evangelical non-Christian Zionists who have launched a website uh, called ChristianZionism.org. Just Google www.ChristianZionism.org. And they felt now with the emergence of the Trump uh, administration and Pence, watch out for Pence, uh, um, they're filled with, uh, I mean, he is uh, beyond. <laughs> uh, let me not go any further. But, it, but it's time now to really elevate the critique of Christian Zionism. And these are evangelicals doing the critique from within the tradition. So look at that website. I need to conclude. Oh, okay. Uh, so let me conclude. So you can see me at the uh, book signing, but I want to thank you for organizing this, Croc in Notre Dame, the responders, and thank you, Assis. And buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> the students. Yeah, Marie Claire, yes.